got my head to be visible. But then I feel like I've got to go like this to see.
very good morning, a very warm welcome, especially those who are visiting St. Leonard's for the baptism of Eleanor and Elijah. It's lovely to have you with us. Uh, so please do sit down and uh, I'll just give a few notices before we begin the service. And a warm welcome to refreshments at the end of the service. Um, although some of you might want to slip out quickly if you were hoping to go down to the Paddy Mon Parade um, event down at the town hall. So I'll understand if you want to slip by. We're hoping that the band won't go by during our last hymn as they have in some years. Now this week uh, there's Bible study on uh, Tuesday evening here at church at 7.30 and then the Tuesday after there's the monthly cat prayer meeting at the Inghamite Church. So a very warm welcome to that. Uh, Bishop Julian's farewell uh, service in the deanery on the 7th of July is at St. Stephen's. There was a mistake on the, on the Darcian website, St. Stephen's, not St. Cuthbert's. So everyone is invited to come along to that to say thank you to Bishop Julian. Uh, St. Margaret's have a summer fair coming up. They'll, they'd love to see you on the 9th if you can get along. On the 10th, uh, parents, please remember we're doing Cornerstone, Cornerstone Club prize giving. So uh, please make a special effort for the children to be here to receive their books. And we've organised a pub meet, and this is for everyone. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Chris Casey, soon to retire, has offered to do a talk on C.S. Lewis, the apologist and Christian author. Uh, he wrote The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, as you know. So it'll be a really good evening. So that's at 7.30 on Monday the 11th of July. Everyone is very welcome indeed. I've forgotten to bring the band's book out with me, so if someone could get that out for me, thank you very much. But we'll, we'll carry on and I'll, I'll give the bands after uh, our first song. When someone is baptised, God is promising, making a commitment to them, and they also, through their parents and godparents, or if they're old enough for themselves, are making a commitment back to God. So let's remember that our God is a promise-making God who we can commit ourselves to as we sing from the breaking of the dawn to the setting of the sun.
you'd like to be seated, please. And those bands I should have read. I published the bands of marriage between Jack Lee Davies, bachelor of this parish, and Louise Catherine Bolt, spinster of this parish. This is for the third time of asking. Also between Elliot Michael Lord, bachelor of this parish, and Carly Lee Newton, spinster of this parish. This is for the first time of asking. If any of you know any cause or just impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, you are to declare it. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Baptism is the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ. When he had risen from the dead, he commanded his followers to go and make disciples of all nations, teaching and baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Baptism with water speaks to us of the cleansing from sin that is ours through faith in the death of Jesus and the new life that God gives us through the Holy Spirit. In baptism, we see the promises of God, that we are joined to Christ and made members of his body and so have the hope of heaven. Children are baptised in response to God's great love. Parents and godparents who have themselves responded to that love now bring their children for baptism. Before this congregation, they must express their own trust in the promises of God and their intention to bring up their children in the life and faith of the Christian church. So let's now pray, especially for those to be baptised, Eleanor and Elijah, and for the family and for ourselves. We all need the grace of God this day. Almighty and loving Heavenly Father, we give you grateful thanks that you have graciously called us to a knowledge of your love and faith in you. Increase this knowledge and confirm this faith in us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these children, that they may be born again and receive your promise of salvation through repentance and faith in Christ. Amen. Jesus said, let the children come to me, do not stop them. We thank God for Eleanor and Elijah who have come to be baptised today. Christ loves them and welcomes them into his church. So I ask you all, and please do everyone respond with the words in bold. Will you support these children as they begin their journey of faith? We will. Will you help them to live and grow within God's family? We will. And now a question to the parents and godparents. So if you would stand please, parents and godparents, and Eleanor and all the other children as well, if you would stand. And they're going to answer this next question. God knows each of us by name and we are his. Parents and godparents, you speak for Eleanor and Elijah today Will you pray for them and help them to follow Christ? We will. And now I've got a question for Eleanor. I'm not going to bother asking Elijah. I'd have, I'd have a long wait to get an answer. But Eleanor, you're going to answer this question for me. Eleanor, do you wish to be baptised? That's brilliant. Thank you very much. And now it's back to the parents and godparents. They're going to answer the following questions. We all wander far from God and lose our way. Christ comes to find us and welcome us home. In baptism, we respond to his call. Therefore, I ask of the parents and godparents, do you turn away from sin? Turn away from sin. Do you reject evil? I reject evil. Do you turn to Christ as Lord? I turn to Christ. Do you trust in Christ as Saviour? Thank you. Now, if you'd all come and stand around the font with me, please. We'll have mum and dad and the family that side, and the godparents this side. No, mum and dad, you're that side. <laughs> Are you coming up as well, you three? 
Yeah. If you come over there, lovely. Doesn't matter which side you go, children. That's, it's fine. Good. So we have now the prayer over the water. So please do join in with the responses, everyone, as we begin the prayer. Praise God who made heaven and earth, who keeps his promise forever. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. Loving Father, we thank you for your servant Moses, who led your people through the waters of the Red Sea to freedom in the promised land. We thank you for your son Jesus who has passed through the deep waters of death and opened for all the way of salvation. Now send your spirit that those who are washed in this water may die with Christ and rise with him to find true freedom as your children, alive in Christ forever. Amen. And brothers and sisters, I ask you now to profess together with the parents and the godparents the faith of the church. So of course it's the custom to stand for the creed, so if you would please stand everyone. Do you believe and trust in God the Father? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ? I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So, Eleanor's going first, aren't you, Eleanor? So, here we are. We'll hold your hand. You come and stand up here for me. Wonderful. Good. What have you named this child? Eleanor, if you just lean over a little bit. Okay, Eleanor, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of the cross. Do not be ashamed of Christ crucified. You are his forever. And then we've got some words that should be on the screen. We say to Eleanor, In bold, fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil, and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. Eleanor, may Almighty God deliver you from the powers of darkness, restore in you the image of his glory, and lead you in the light and obedience of Christ. Amen. And may God, who has received you by baptism into his church, pour upon you the riches of his grace, that within the company of Christ's pilgrim people you may daily be renewed by his anointing Holy Spirit and come at the last to the inheritance of the saints in glory. Amen. Well done. Do you want a tissue? There we go. If you jump down. Well done. Okay. Let's have this little chat. What have you named this child? Elijah. Elijah, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ claims you for his own. Receive the sign of the cross. Do not be ashamed of Christ crucified. You are his forever. And we say to Elijah as well, fight valiantly as a disciple of Christ against sin, the world, and the devil, and remain faithful to Christ to the end of your life. May Almighty God deliver you from the powers of darkness, restore in you the image of his glory, and lead you in the light and obedience of Christ. Amen. 
And may God, who has received you by baptism into his church, pour upon you the riches of his grace, that within the company of Christ's pilgrim people, you may daily be renewed by his anointing Holy Spirit and come at the last to the inheritance of the saints in glory. Amen. Well, let's pray for everyone who cares for these children, especially uh, Ollie and Anna and his big brother and sisters as well. Uh, let's pray as well for the wider family, for the godparents as they fulfill their responsibilities. And just hold in your heart any children who are dear to us. Maybe you have children, grandchildren, uh, godchildren. Just bring them to the Lord now as I say this prayer. Faithful and loving God, bless those who care for these children and protect their home from all evil. Grant them your gifts of wisdom, steadfastness, gentleness, patience and joy and pour upon them your healing and reconciling love. By their example, may these children grow up to know you in public worship and in private prayer and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ to the end of their life. Amen. Well, we've just got to say a word of welcome. Can you come with me to the step, Eleanor? Bring Elijah with you, or Mummy can bring him. Here we go. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Eleanor and Elijah, by one spirit, we're all baptised into one body. And we say to them, we welcome you into the fellowship of faith. We are children of the same Heavenly Father. We welcome you. Well, well done to Eleanor and Elijah. Let's give them a round of applause to say welcome. Lovely, right, so if you'd like to head back to your pews, we're just going to sing a song and then uh, it'll be Cornerstone Club for the children. So we're going to sing Mighty Mighty Saviour. Now are there actions for this choir? There are. I'm, you know I'm useless at action, so please do keep an eye on the choir uh, if you want to know the actions. Annabelle looks like she knows and Eve and Susanna. You all know, don't you? Great, here we go then. No one is good. Just click it another one.
So children, Cornerstone Club begins now. If you'd like to head for the green room, visiting children, you're very welcome to join them. And uh, everyone else do be finding our reading from Ezekiel. Today's reading is taken from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 33, beginning at verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, speak to your people and say to them, When I bring the sword against a land, and the people of the land choose one of their men and make him their watchman, and he sees the sword coming against the land and blows the trumpet to warn the people, then if anyone hears the trumpet but does not heed the warning, and the sword comes and takes their life. Their blood will be on their own head. Since they heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not heed the warning, their blood will be on their own head. If they had heeded the warning, they would have saved themselves. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet to warn the people, and the sword comes and takes someone's life, that person's life will be taken because of their sin. But I will hold the watchman accountable for their blood. Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, you wicked person, you will surely die. And you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways. That wicked person will die for their sin. And I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. Son of man, say to the Israelites, this is what you are saying. Our offences and sins weigh us down and we are wasting away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me lead us in a prayer. And now, O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable In your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, I think uh, there's a slide to begin with. There we are. It's one you've seen before, if you're a regular here. And uh, let's uh, begin with a little bit of a recap. On the face of it, uh, you'd think that the Jews forced to live in exile in Babylon in the year 597 before Christ were in a far worse place than the rest of the nation who were allowed to stay in their homes in Judah and in Jerusalem. I mean, where would you rather be tonight? Uh, an ethnically cleansed migrant dumped in a faraway foreign land or in your own bed? Well, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? The exiles in Babylon lost virtually everything when they were deported, or so it seemed. Their Babylonian conquerors had wrenched them away from their houses and their fields and many of their possessions. And on top of that, they were far away from the city of Jerusalem and its beautiful temple that they loved so dearly. The delight of their eyes was only a memory. Meanwhile, for those left behind in the Jewish homeland, well, life pretty much got back to normal. In fact, Some of them did very nicely for themselves 
and even managed to take over the vacant homes and farms of their absent neighbors. But it turned out that uh, these people left in Judah were in a far worse place because judgment was looming. Early in 588 BC, the Babylonians decided that they'd had enough of Judah's troublesome and rebellious king Zedekiah, and so they laid siege to Jerusalem. Eighteen months later, after many inhabitants had starved to death, the walls of the city were breached, and in 587 BC, Jerusalem fell with great loss of life. It was the most traumatic event in the history of Israel. And what made it unimaginably awful was that the Lord, the God of Israel, repeatedly claimed through prophets like Jeremiah that he was behind these terrible events. The destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians was to be seen as God's judgment on his sinful people. And it was the sin of idolatry that especially provoked God's anger. Some of the people had completely abandoned the worship of the Lord. But more often the people of Judah reckoned that the Lord would tolerate it if they shared their affections between him and other gods. And despite repeated warnings over many years, they complacently told themselves that the Lord would never do anything about it, about their unfaithfulness. Judgment was something that happened to other nations, not them. And even when Jerusalem was besieged, the inhabitants clung to the idea that something would turn up, they'd be let off the hook, and that the worst would never happen. But it did. Now here at St. Leonard's, we've been looking at the book of Ezekiel on Sundays for the last month or so, And if you're joining us for the first time today, one crucial piece of information that you need to know is that Ezekiel is one of the exiles in Babylon. So he's not in Jerusalem, he's in Babylon. He's one of those 10,000 people who were deported in 597 BC. And more than that, he is a prophet of the Lord. And if you've got today's reading open in front of you, uh, Ezekiel 33, On page 865, I'd like uh, you to follow verses 22 and 23. We didn't actually get this far in the reading, but uh, these are crucial verses, verses 22 and 23 on page 865, where it says, In the twelfth year of our exile, in the tenth month, on the fifth day, a man who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, The city has fallen. Now the evening before the man arrived, the hand of the Lord was on me, and he opened my mouth before the man came to me in the morning. So my mouth was opened, and I was no longer silent. So here, news reaches Ezekiel and the Jewish community in Babylon that the unthinkable has happened. Jerusalem has been ransacked and destroyed by the Babylonian army. And of course, the big question is, how will Ezekiel and his fellow exiles react to this appalling news from home? Well, Ezekiel has already been told how he ought to react. If you've been here on previous Sundays, you'll know that the Lord has been keeping him informed about events in Jerusalem. Uh, Back in verse 2 of chapter 24, he was told that the siege of Jerusalem had started. And in the rest of that chapter, the Lord makes it clear to his prophet that the city is doomed because of its wickedness. But what about the Jews living in exile in Babylon? Are they doomed as well, this, this remnant? Perhaps not. Because at the beginning of chapter 33, Ezekiel is told that God has appointed him as a watchman to warn others. In those days, in that part of the world, every village, every town, every city appointed sentries to keep watch for approaching enemy raiders. And these watchmen would quite likely be stationed at the top of a tower of some sort, and and they would constantly scan the horizon 
looking for the glint maybe of spears or swords, or maybe for the dust of horsemen. And the vital piece of equipment for a watchman was, of course, a trumpet. If they spotted enemy troop movements, then the watchman was responsible for sounding the alarm so that everyone in the village or town could prepare to defend himself. Now this uh, watchman parable that, that God uses to describe Ezekiel's role reveals two startling facts about the character of the Lord. So first of all, we learn that there is a very real sense in which God is our enemy. If you look at verse 2 of chapter 33, you'll see that God speaks of bringing a sword against a land. So God does do judgment, and it would be a massive mistake to dismiss the idea that he could be against us. And this idea is very much there as well in the New Testament. For example, in Romans 1, verse 18, Paul writes, For the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people. God is against every one of us. And the reason is our sinfulness. And it's not as if he can just, you know, shrug his shoulders and let it go. If he did that, he'd be unjust. He'd be like a judge who couldn't be bothered to pass a sentence on a convicted criminal. He'd be totally untrue to what he is. No, the holiness of God means that he must be against us because of our rebellion against him. And yet, the other startling thing about the Lord's character is that he is also the one who appoints a watchman to warn people of his coming in judgment. Now, isn't that amazing? He appoints the watchman. Now, who ever heard of, say, an Air Force Marshal who decides to send his squadrons on a raid over enemy territory, but then, as soon as his planes take off, he orders his second-in-command to phone the targeted city and tell them to sound the air raid sirens and take to the air raid shelters. But effectively, that is what God is doing through Ezekiel. He is using the prophet to warn people of his own impending judgment. And why does he do this? Well, verse 11. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And as we're told elsewhere in scripture, not only is the Lord rightly angry with sin, but he is also compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. And so Ezekiel is commissioned as a watchman and told he must sound the alarm by preaching to the exiles. Friends, there's something that the people of Jerusalem and the exiles, and ourselves, there's something that we all have in common. We're all living in the last days. We're all living in a period leading up to a day of judgment. And I should add that uh, for us, uh, these uh, are the last, last days. For us here today, these are the last, last days. People have lived through last days in the past, but there won't be any more last days after these ones in which we're living. As we've seen, the people of Jerusalem failed to take notice of the warnings in their last days, and they perished. And as we study Ezekiel, we're hoping that the exiles will take note, and things will be different for them. But what about us? At the beginning of the New Testament letter to the Hebrews, it says this, In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son, after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So we notice again how seriously God takes sin. He doesn't just brush it under the carpet. Instead, his son deals with it by suffering judgment for the sins of others on the cross. And so, on top of that, Jesus also speaks to us. In him, we have a message from God about the seriousness of sin, but also in him, we have a message of God's mercy, that he takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. 
In other words, Jesus is our watchman, warning us of judgment, but also holding out the possibility of salvation. Have you ever wondered why Jesus frequently tells his disciples to watch? Well, it's because he wants them to be awake to the fact that they're living in the last days, days in which judgment is coming, but also days in which salvation is there for the taking. And he's also preparing them for the time when they too will become watchmen, under watchmen, if you like, warning people of judgment and also pointing them to the Saviour. So how do you respond to living in these last, last days? Ezekiel 33 makes it clear that each person has a responsibility to turn to the Lord, to repent of our sins. If we ignore the warning and we perish, we've only ourselves to blame. And later in the chapter, the emphasis shifts to those who have previously repented. They need to stay in that place of grace. They mustn't give up. And maybe there are some here today for whom that word is especially relevant. But what about you? Have you taken to heart what the watchman says? As surely as I live, says the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they may turn from their ways and live. Amen. We're going to sing the hymn, Hark, a trumpet call is sounding. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. 
It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat with you. In Christ, you shared our life, that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave you thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ, our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you our sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song of heaven. like to be seated. If you're a visitor from another Christian church and receive Holy Communion in faith in Christ, uh, you're very welcome to do the same here at St. Leonard's. Uh, we're approaching the communion rail from the centre aisle and going back through the side. We're staying spread out at the rail. If you wish only to take the bread and not the cup, uh, that's what many folk are doing, that's perfectly fine, or you can take both the bread and the wine. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper.
Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. And together again. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you, our souls and bodies, to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's love?
before I give the blessing, I remember I needed to give this children's Bible to Eleanor on your baptism day. There you go. So, oh, and get Isabel to read it to you. I should have also said that Janet Mills is also a godmother uh, for Eleanor, but unfortunately she's well, so unable to be here. And um, actually Tracy and Isabel and Janet are related in some way. To, it's too complicated to, to explain, but anyway, they are related in some way. Cousins or something. <laughs> anyway, the blessing. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish, strengthen, and settle you in the faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in the light and peace of Christ. Thanks be to God. <laughs>